All right. Welcome to our second video day. Today is March 29. Um, I will make a quick introduction. And then as a speaker today, we have Jelle Mlina from IF, who is going to present uh, the latest detailed roadmap for the identity ecosystem of IOTA. But first, uh, two little uh, information announcements. Uh, we are now 12 XT members, XT identity members, these ones. And um, this is a nice growth. We have been around for, I think, two months now. So it's nice to see stuff going forward and people getting interested in the space. And for everyone who's watching this and who might be interested to join as well, I will quickly uh, let you know how you can do this, which is either just join the Identity X Teams channel on Discord and ask around there, and or go to our IOTA community uh, X Teams GitHub and open an issue with a called application and just put in some details of you why you would like to join, who you are, and stuff like that. And then we can just handle it from there. All right, so far so good. And I will hand over to Jelle now, who is going to present his roadmap. All right. Let's see if I can get everything set up for that. <laughs> All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes. And, okay, and you guys can hear me, that's good. All right. Um, yeah, so for today, I would like to just go uh, through everything that we have planned for IOTA Identity. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's some brief introduction on what is IOTA Identity. For this meeting, I'm just gonna assume everyone knows IOTA identity, otherwise you're not part of the X team. And if you're watching the video, uh, I would recommend to catch up with, for example, our EclipseCon video on explaining IOTA identity beforehand to let all of this make sense. So I'm gonna skip this introduction. Um, yeah, the development goals of the repository. Um, so there's many decentralized identity implementations out there, the DID implementations, and uh, actually in total, that's 85 different implementations. And of course, we have to stand out in order to really get somewhere. Um, so we have some of our own development goals set up that uh, yeah, hopefully makes us unique and creates a little bit of focus on where we, uh, where we are the best performing. So, the first sentence, provide a high quality, secure and performing decentralized identity framework that enables identity for people, organization, things and objects. It feels a little bit like logical, uh, nothing maybe special in that, uh, but to, to explain it a little bit, uh, the high quality, secure and performing um, is not that standard actually with DID implementations. Like I said, there are about 85 registered on W3C. We're actually not part of that list of 85 that are registered yet. But if you actually look into those, quite a few of them are a quick and dirty implementation. Uh, quite a few are abandoned already. And some of them are actually high quality and well-maintained. So we wanna be in that list. We are not, IOTA Identity is not a project that is going to be delivered with a version 1.0 and then abandoned. No, it's going to be uh, continuously improving with a focus on really high quality code. So therefore, we also focus on delivering high quality code over meeting deadlines, something that the IOTA Foundation is never good at anyway, uh, but also really performing as we want to uh, yeah, make sure that identities can be used for situations where you quickly have to resolve an identity such as uh, access control when you want to scan your identity at the physical gate 
apparently people get annoyed if it takes more than 200 milliseconds so i guess that's a very good benchmark to try and hit and make sure that under 200 milliseconds identities can be validated um, the second goal enabling developers to utilize iota identity without without requiring in-depth knowledge on iota decentralized identity or security is kind of an extension of our strongest unique selling point on iota identity which is the feeless aspect the feeless aspect of iota makes it so that you don't have to purchase any cryptocurrency at all uh, which is a huge difference by the way between a, a fee of like one cent versus no no cent is that you actually don't have to purchase the cryptocurrency at all and that makes it so much easier to use iota identity uh, that that is an extremely useful unique selling point um, at the same time of course we're public permissionless and that combination doesn't exist yet public permissionless feeless for identity and um, yeah we really want to take that usb to the extreme and say it should be really easy to use iota identity so iota has been known to be quite complex so what we're going to try and do with the framework is hide most of the difficult interactions and kind of automate that behind uh, layers of abstraction such that as a developer you don't have to know really how iota works iota identity takes care of that it utilizes iota but you don't have to learn too much about it uh, decentralized identity is also well, everyone here probably knows you kind of have to get into the topic. You have to do quite a little bit of reading, understand all the terminology, and then think how you can apply that. Well, we want to take away a lot from those difficult steps on learning about it and kind of make sure that the framework takes care of a lot of those things such that you only need to know the high level concepts instead of all the details. And lastly, security. Uh, as you're probably aware, the, we have the Stronghold project within IOTA. And uh, yeah, that's kind of an out of the box security solution. And if we provide that as part of our framework, that means that when someone uses IOTA identity, they don't suddenly have to also reinvent the security mechanism for how to store your private key securely. It can come with the framework, which is really powerful. So I'm very thankful that we have Stronghold as part of IOTA Foundation as well. So that is, yeah, the ease of use for developers is really our focus with IOTA identity. And hopefully that will, yeah, bring about actual adoption of self-sovereign identity. Uh, as with basically all the self-sovereign identity implementations, you have to maximize privacy. You really have to focus on GDPR compliance if you want to have corporate adoption and uh, human adoption in those, uh, those two senses. So yeah, naturally that's also a focus for us. And in the end, we also wanna connect with existing identity infrastructure. Uh, this is to make sure that other developers for self-sovereign identity are aware of IOTA identity and that they will kind of come to us eventually because they, they start to interact with IOTA identity through their own comfortable framework, such as Hyperledger Aries or the European self-sovereign identity uh, uh, implementation. Um, so that's kind of the goals for IOTA identity. Um, if you guys have any questions, by the way, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, uh, and ask them. Otherwise, I will just continue talking. So let's, let's go over a little bit where are we right now with IOTA identity uh, in order to get an idea of where we're going. So IOTA Identity is currently released as version 0.2, which is an alpha version. And it kind of already does everything that you need to do when you want to implement decentralized identity. So it has a full DID standard implementation and a full verifiable credentials implementation, including verifiable presentations, which is part of the verifiable credentials standard. And um, yeah, that, that's with that, you can already do everything that you need to do for decentralized identity. Uh, for example, uh, lately people have been talking about the Microsoft implementation via ION, uh, which is anchored into Bitcoin. And their implementation is also kind of just an DID implementation. 
and they, I believe they don't have verifiable credential implementation, but you might be able to leverage another verifiable credential implementation besides ION. Um, but that means that we're kind of already on par or even more feature rich than such an implementation. Um, and at that stage, everyone here in the experience team or in the community is actually able to just utilize IOTA identity already in their projects. It's an alpha version, so things might break. We do quite often breaking changes. That is the point of an alpha. Uh, but we're hoping to stabilize that part at least, that the APIs on the low level will start to stabilize, how the transactions will look like will stabilize. And eventually when we reach beta and hopefully a release candidate, then uh, yeah, things will start to stabilize. But that doesn't mean that you can't use it until that point. It's just you might have to maintain it a little bit more at this stage. Um, yeah, so we already have the WASM bindings for JavaScript and TypeScript as well, as we recognize that not everyone is a Rust developer. Um, and we already have some unique features on top of just the ID and verifiable credentials implementations, such as an uh, increased scalability of our DID documents. Uh, this is we've done through a yeah, unique mechanism, which is actually slightly similar to how ION does it with uh, their updates. Um, and at the same time, we also have a uh, very nice revocation mechanism based on kind of almost a one time. My microphone went off for some reason. Uh, so you guys can hear me, right? Yep. OK, thanks. And uh, yeah, the, the rectification mechanism is kind of based on almost one-time signatures, um, took inspiration of that idea at least. And that actually makes sure that we can guarantee that the revocation part is GDPR compliant, which is not always the case with other implementations. However, we're still lacking some things. I just kind of arbitrarily mentioned two uh, points that we would we are focused on right now, which is the interoperability between applications and the difficulty to use it right now, uh, because it's really a low level implementation. Uh, that means that you really do have to know IOTA and DID to really get into the topic. And it's a little bit poorly documented, but we're working on those things. So what is the next step? Well, the next step is IOTA identity 1.0. Uh, this is where we want to focus on out-of-the-box security uh, through Stronghold integration, uh, which will help people build an IOTA identity-based application without having to you know, deal with the private keys on their own. And uh, yeah, interoperability between applications. And this one I find actually really important um, because if there are several people here in the experience team or in the community that want to build an application on IOTA identity, um, they will have probably an application that talks with a, another application or a server, and you do that through messages. For example, if you want to verify a verifiable credential, you have to kind of do a small negotiation with the other party that you say like, all right, I want to present a verifiable credential. This is the one it looks like. And the other side says, well, okay, I trust these identities. So please give me a verifiable credential that is signed by these and that identities. There's kind of a standardized way of messaging between these applications, or at least if we standardize it, those messages, that means that if two different developers make an application using IOTA identity, and they both use the same way to communicate between applications, uh, mobile apps, uh, websites, and everything like that, uh, they immediately become interoperable with each other because they use the same messages. And that's actually really strong because that means that, uh, for example, the self project from uh, the IOTA Foundation would immediately be compatible with, upper, with whatever project uh, someone is working on. And yeah, that makes people uh, be able to use the self wallet for that application. Um, yeah, but there, there are many other ways that you can benefit from this. So we find this really important and that's actually a really big focus of uh, the development right now. 
Um, yeah, at the same time, you can see yeah, we're working with, or we actually have completed an initial Chrysalis Phase 2 integration, and we're working on the documentation as promised. Uh, but we're also developing C bindings uh, to make sure that we have better IoT support and uh, native mobile development support as well, because uh, WASM wasn't good enough for just that. So that's kind of what we're aiming for IOTA Identity uh, 1.0 as a release candidate. We'll have this feature set. And with that feature set, you'll be able to kind of build uh, a lot of applications already and immediately create interoperability and uh, yeah, build it in a secure way using Stronghold. So we find this uh, a very good way of releasing a 1.0 because it's everything that you need for the fundamentals of an identity framework. Uh, however, there's, there's so much more potential that we can tap into with IOTA identity. So we move on and we go beyond 1.0. So when we release 1.0, that's definitely not the end. It feels like it's only just the beginning uh, because things that we will start to focus on is bringing the framework to the next level and making sure that it is even easier to use, more feature rich uh, and stuff like that. So here on the left side of these, uh, yeah, kind of uh, tickets almost, you can see three ones that are focused on privacy. Uh, which is very important with cell sovereign identity is when you share information, uh, you minimize the amount of information that you actually share. Uh, the example that I always take is a, a driver's license. If I want to share with someone here that I'm above 18 in order to get some alcohol, or if I want to prove that I have a driver's license, I would currently show my entire driver's license and you would know my name, my date of birth, the date of acquisition, the type of driver's license, etc. Everything that's on there. And with selective disclosure, you would be able to choose which fields you reveal and which you don't. So, for example, if you would want to prove that you're above 18, you can just reveal your date of birth. If you want to prove that you have had your driver's license for more than five years, you would be able to just reveal your date of acquisition. And that is a very important improvement uh, over uh, yeah, the standard verifiable credentials. And we can take that actually one step further with zero, no uh, with zero knowledge proofs or ZKP. Um, this is cryptographically speaking a lot more difficult, so it will take a little bit more time before we uh, develop that. But uh, in that case, you would be able to kind of reveal no information while still being able to prove that a claim is true about you. So I can prove that I'm above 18 without actually even revealing my date of birth. And that's, yeah, that, that's basically how far you can push privacy in terms of verifiable credentials. So that's definitely on our roadmap as well. Um, and then there's one last other thing, which is the pairwise identities, which is the idea to reduce linkage between your identity. If I have one decentralized identity and I use that to log into websites, I use it for self, I use it for uh, my signing up to my bank, to some cryptocurrency exchanges, etc. I will kind of leave my same unique identifier everywhere. And uh, if those get leaked through a database leak or they are kind of bad parties that just want to sell that for uh, to advertisers, uh, what happens is that someone can kind of track your activity over the web. They can link your account through different activities that you did, eventually maybe even identifying who you are. So what we basically do, and here's again where the power of IOTA really comes in, we uh, can create pairwise identities. And that is the idea that every time you interact with a new party, you actually create an entire new identity. You just use for the interaction with them. And since we're feeless with IOTA, that's actually super simple. Um, and that will reduce the linkage. You can still collect verifiable credentials and kind of share them uh, using that the different identities so you can kind of link up your identities temporarily where you prove uh yeah this is my identity with you i've also have an identity that carries the driver's license so i will prove temporarily that these two identities are connected 
And then afterwards, for example, you could enforce your GDPR rights and say, I want you to forget that other identity. Um, and at least in Europe, they'll have to accept that. Uh, but even then, worst case scenario, two identities of yourself would be linked together, but you might have a hundred or so. So uh, yeah, the linkage will be uh, at least very much reduced. Um, and these are kind of different steps that we would like to take with uh, yeah the the 1 beyond 1.0. These will be like several releases where we just add one feature to the framework. Um, other features would be the identity actor, which is kind of a program that knows if it gets a an identity message that are standardized, as I explained before, it would be able to respond as well for you. So it kind of already knows how these interactions generally work, and this can then all be automated. And as a developer, that's really nice because, yeah, you don't have to implement that every time. Like if I get this message, then respond appropriately. The actor can already handle that as well. And then you can just plug in callbacks as a developer where you say, okay, please don't just automatically handle that. I want to provide have the user do an action on, on this part, or I want to uh, do it in my own way through programming a different function that handles it differently. So it creates a lot of flexibility, but at the same time, automation, making, again, the framework easier to use. And we will also add very important uh, features such as public credentials, which is basically verifiable credentials. I think his micro and I'm back. again. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it does this every five minutes if nobody else talks. Hmm. <laughs> I can yeah. just I can just ping every five minutes if that helps. Go on. Yeah, yeah. We used to do like someone had to cough every five minutes, but somehow that was less funny during Corona times. But yeah, anywho, the public credentials. So the, the idea of the public credentials is that basically instead of storing your verifiable credentials on your phone, which is only reachable when a person is actually on their phone with the app open, um, credentials can also be published directly on IOTA. And this does not work for human credentials as that will violate GDPR. So this is just a feature for identity for organizations and identity for things. Uh, however, for those two, it's actually very useful. For example, you can have a corporate profile, which immediately proves that you are ISO uh, certified, uh, that you are uh, connected to a certain domain name, that you have done business with uh, certain other types of companies. So you can kind of create an actual public profile about yourself, which is completely verifiable. And that is just completely found on the Tangle. So anyone can just query that and know all that information about your organization, which is super useful. And at the same time, we also want domain name verification, uh, which is the idea that you can indeed connect your domain to the identity, such that kind of the identity says, all right, I'm connected to this specific domain name, such as uh, iota.org. And then you can actually visit iota.org and look up in its DNS records what kind of identities are linked to that. So it might, in its DNS record, have the DID linked back into it. So you get this, you create this circle of referencing, and when both, when the circle is completed, then you can trust that this identity is linked to this uh, domain. So that creates kind of an additional level of trust to an organization, because if I give you a random DID, you would find it hard to verify who that is. But if I give you a URL such as iota.org, uh, for people that's a lot easier to process and see, hey, this is who I expect this to be. So this verifiable credential is signed by iota.org instead of DID colon iota colon 2xw blah, 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 right? So that's hopefully also a very important improvement. Kind of this, this creates evidence towards a company saying who they say, proving who they say they are using a decentralized identity. And you don't have to just have one, uh, one piece of evidence such as the domain name, but you can have multiple as well. Um, and we hope to support 
more and more features that allow you to create more evidence to connect to your identity to prove who you are. So that will be kind of the, the 1.0 stage. So, so you can expect a 1.1 release, 1.2 release, and these are hopefully non-breaking changes um, and they just add more and more features to the framework. Then we also have the tooling category. Uh, category. So this one is uh, a little bit new, uh, as in I haven't fully explored uh, in depth all the type of tooling that we could consider. But as our framework grows and as the, the amount of features grow, it will also be very important for developers to verify that what they're doing is correct and that they have more debugging uh, potential uh, as well. So for example, it would be very nice to have an online resolver for your identities that you can also use to debug an identity. So when a developer makes an, a mistake, uh, they can actually see the entire chain of DID transactions and see, all right, this is what I did wrong. Why this is important is that the framework actually ignores any transaction which is wrong. So if it has an incorrect signature, if it has an incorrect order of linking, uh, those kind of things, those are easy mistakes that a developer could make. The framework will just ignore it. And this is done because uh, otherwise people can spam the identity transactions towards a specific identity and it will slow down the resolving of that identity. So what we do instead, if anything is wrong, the framework just drops it and ignores it. It doesn't warn you or anything like that. So we do need some tooling to actually warn you about what is going wrong. And at the same time, we also want um, yeah, developers to have an easy time when they develop an application that they can quickly have a, a nice front end uh, to uh, create an identity, create, like uh, design a verifiable credential, sign it, store it somewhere, etc. So this is also the position where we see self uh, play a role uh, such that self will kind of become a tool for developers to use as well. And then lastly, we have the category of kind of nice to haves. We're definitely going to do these. They're just a little bit further into the future. Um, so these are things that we currently can't do yet because there is prerequisites that, uh, that need to be implemented. Um, and there's also, uh, yeah, just things that don't have priority right now. So you three, see three SDKs specifically for people, organizations, and devices. And here's the idea that even though our framework is able to handle all identities, when you as a developer focus on one of the three, you probably need a different feature set than the other ones. So we can kind of create a higher level implementation that just only gives you the tools that you need and kind of does this filtering for you, making your life again easier as a developer. Hopefully you see the trend in, in this, that we continuously have that goal. Uh, we also want to integrate with other IOTA projects, such as IOTA Access, something which is really, really well um, linked to IOTA Identity. Uh, similarly, with Oracles, you can imagine that uh, the Oracles, as they are released right now, they kind of prove that a um, stream of data comes from a single source. But what if you can also identify that source and it is signed by a, a specific party, such as the IoT device developer or the, the API itself, right? For example, if you want to have a Binance feed, then an Oracles that is can prove that it is like approved by Binance itself uh, through their the Oracle's identity would again be a lot more powerful because you don't just see the data, you actually create trust in the source of the data instead of just trust in the data itself. Um, and yeah, so that's directly already an interaction with streams. We'll probably also come up with some cool ideas how IOTA identity can be used in smart contracts, uh, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, there are some more small topics in there, in here that I don't wanna discuss in full. Two that I wanna discuss further is indeed integration with other existing frameworks. 
such as Hyperledge Ares, the Universal Resolver, and the European Self-Sovereign Identity uh, Framework. Yet, yeah, we hope that that will attract more self-sovereign identity uh, developers to us, uh, hopefully also, of course, from corporate partners. Um, and at the same time, just creating compatibility with these networks kind of enriches the whole self-sovereign identity um, yeah, community, so to say. And instead of that, we have like some small clusters of uh, success in identity, we can start to combine them and create interoperability between all of them. So we want that to happen. However, uh, yeah, we kind of personally, I'm kind of waiting for 1.0 uh, for at least to stabilize before we even attempt this, because yeah, there will be a lot of breaking changes, and we don't want to like have to continuously also maintain these integrations into the other frameworks. And lastly, there's the very big challenge around verifiable credential standardization, which is the idea that if there's a driver's license giving out in the Netherlands and the driver's license given out in Germany, uh, we would rather that these two driver's licenses are kind of the same verifiable credential type, such that when you present one to the other country, it will immediately recognize what it is. And that's a lot easier said than done. So this is actually quite a difficult task. How do you make sure that when two different companies or governments across the world, or even to IOTA community members across the world, realize that they're using the same verifiable credential and kind of, yeah, standardize, standardizing the layout of this. For example, that they call the name name and not surname, because if you call it surname, that's, then it already, the other application wouldn't recognize that as a name. So yeah, this interoperability, the standardization on the actual verifiable credential level is a challenge that we haven't really solved yet. We have some ideas towards it. Uh, some of them might be also really to utilize uh, JSON-LD or JSON-linked data. I guess this is the moment where we have to cough. No? <laughs> You didn't cough yeah. early enough. Yeah, uh, maybe not. <laughs> All right, sorry for that. But uh, yeah, so that was actually the end. Uh, these are the. This is the roadmap as we have currently defined it, and this will already take a long time before that. Uh, for that will be completed, but that is okay, right? Like it's it's not that people or organizations will wait for IOTA identity to be finished before you. Uh, start developing on it. It's uh, it's all about continuous improvement and increasing, increasing the feature set. Um, yeah, so this is very common in software development that you have a roadmap that extends for a long time. At the same time, this is also incomplete. Uh, there are already several new ideas that I had since creating this roadmap that are not on here. For example, it doesn't actually state our Rust embedded uh implementation or at least refactoring such that you can use rust embedded with iota identity um so yeah did th this this roadmap will grow but hopefully we will soon be able to yeah visualize this in more detail better on a repository and in less detail on the roadmap.iota.org as well um so that is it in terms of the roadmap. Are there any questions? Doesn't seem like it. I actually have a little question about Stronghold, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so in the in the GitHub there there are some stronghold files. So it's been explored already. How how far off do you think we are in regards to to getting that integration together? Or is that a further down the line sort of thing? Uh, it's actually uh, one of the higher priorities right now. Uh, so the what we've merged so far kind of is our first implementation with stronghold which is just very basic around uh yeah storing the private key that you generate when you create an uh, identity document in stronghold and be able to retrieve that 
So that's the basis and a very important basis. Uh, but on top of that, we kind of want to create an additional abstraction layer to also to be able to store the verifiable credentials and kind of also automate the whole stronghold as well, because uh, utilizing stronghold isn't as easy, but we can wrap that away a little bit. So uh, yeah, the first integration has already been done successful, um, which is by the way on the dev branch. It's not actually part of the, the release yet. That will be part of 0 0.3. Um, Sorry. Yeah, but but we're getting there. No, that that's cool. Like the, I mean, the private keys is is the most important thing. So it's good that that's already um, looked into. So yeah, cool. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, I do. Um, I just think trying to think how to frame the question. You know, looking into the future two years, five years, maybe even 10 years, like how, how would a digital identity look like for an end user? And I'm just thinking, you know, multi-citizenship, uh, um, there's so much, so much stuff can go into identities. So would, would an individual have an identity with a single uh, provider like IOTA or Ethereum, or is it is a digital identity just gonna be um, a, a mixed bag of, oh, there's some of it existing on Ethereum, there's some of it existing on IOTA, there's some of it going through Microsoft, uh, ION or so. How, how does that sit together or how do you see that, that playing out over time? Um, yeah, so if we take the two years, five years, 10 years, which I quite like, is I think in, in about two years, uh, we're still in a very early stage for identity where kind of like the innovative community around DLT, around cryptocurrencies and organizations, uh, the partners around that, will start to really explore this more and actually integrate it into some of their uh, products uh, as well. But I, I wouldn't expect it really being life-changing to people yet. Uh, might be different on an IoT level, but even, even that two years is a short amount of time for such an change in how the how things work in five years time that might be a little bit different i think for like iot devices communicating with each other iot and organizations with each other uh, as well that's that's probably going to be quite big already in five years and for people there will be some nice cooler things going on you might be able to uh yeah have one app that Kind of does quite a few things for you it allows you to log into different websites it may allow you to uh yeah handle uh, different things in certain smart cities that are like early adopters such as that you can board a train using your identity or maybe even in some cases travel uh internationally um and yeah so that's also the point where I would expect multiple identity implementations to really start uh, coexisting. Probably not mixing all too much yet, but when you go to the 10 year mark, that's really where I think that it will literally have a very big impact on our lives. Uh, as a society, we will be able to kind of use our phone carrying our identity or well, assuming that we uh, we do that on our phone, uh, but you will probably utilize your digital identity uh, to do almost like everything where you need to identify yourself, uh, including also kind of controlling and sharing your own data. Um, and since hopefully by that time, things will be a lot more broader adopted across different companies, co countries, etc. I would expect that due to some companies and countries betting on one implementation and others on another that there will be very actively uh, being built like bridges to making sure that uh, these implementations work alongside each other can work with each other so it's very unlikely indeed that there will be one winner and actually the self-sovereign identity community is probably the biggest in interoperability from any dlt type of projects like the universal resolver that is literally on the screen right now, 
I believe, resolves about half of the identity methods, which means that if you have an app uh, that utilizes the universal results Universal Resolver from the Decentralized Identity Foundation, it would be able to, sc to scan and understand about 40 different identity implementations. Uh, so it doesn't matter which one you use. So yeah, with that in mind, I do believe that there will be, uh, identity will have a large impact on the world and it will probably be several identity implementations running alongside each other. I do think, however, that if there's gonna be a, a competition in terms of fees that that is just not going to happen uh, it will probably either be private networks uh, iota since we're feeless or other feeless networks but i don't expect like something where you have to pay uh, a lot of money as an, at least as a person and probably as an iot device purely because of scale um, those probably can't have fees if you really focus on just organizations, organizations probably don't care too much about it. They'll be able to float those fees. But uh, yeah, so that's that, cool. that's my answer, I guess. <laughs> awesome, thanks, yeah. Any further questions? All right, that was enough awkward silence. Uh, <laughs> how, many, how many seconds of awkward silence is enough to, to conclude the questions? Yes. Well, apparently you were too early there. <laughs> mm. First time around.